This is part of the humanitarian corridor. Again, an Israeli idea that there should be a humanitarian corridor. Well, here we are, day one of the humanitarian corridor, and an aid worker is killed in, when, by two Israeli tank shells. Um, I think there are questions we need to ask of the Israeli authorities here. Did something go wrong? Was it targeting, as the company believes? Was it deliberately brought under fire? I don't know the answer. Um, it disturbs me deeply that a human being contracted effectively by UNRWA, um, working in a company that was contracted by UNRWA, has lost his life. A family is in mourning today um, because of this, and I think we have to think very carefully about this ceasefire. I'd like to think that there is some way that the Security Council would step up to the plate, become very relevant here, because people around the world, many, many people, are saying that they're sick of these pictures. They're heartily sickened by the images of babies on mortuary floors, of women, of children suffering. And I would say, get in touch with your Security Council delegation. Look them up on the internet. Send them emails. Say, we are fed up of this fighting. We are sick of the rockets, of course. We're sick of this bombardment that's going on. We've had enough. Let's use the Security Council as a democratic institution. Let's make it relevant. Let's show that we, the people, are capable of making it act. Because right now, there is a resolution in the Security Council. It calls for a ceasefire. It calls for rockets to stop, I, I, I think, too. But what it does is send a very strong signal to the parties that the war, the conflict, has got to stop. We all feel that very strongly and very passionately from the ground. And it's high time that that message got through uh, to the delegations in New York. The Secretary General has said quite clearly that he's, he regrets the fact that the Council has not reached consensus. If it could reach consensus, then a very powerful signal would be sent to the parties on the ground that the world community was united in backing peace. That has to happen first, then the parties on the ground have to heed that call, because at the moment it's Gaza, another day, another death, and we have to stop that. Okay, Chris, uh, just so that uh, you're aware, we did in fact put um, the questions about the UN aid convoy in the past couple of hours to uh, Major Leibovich from and what the, they say? and they said they had no details of what the attack. What did she say? She said they had no details of the attack. That's just for your, for your information. They had no details of the attack. So we will be putting those questions and did to they the say that they would, did they say? Did they say they would... No. Did they say they would investigate the they attack? They merely said they had no details Did you ask them if they would the investigate attack? the attack? Chris, we're going to have to leave it there. We will put those but questions... But did you get the impression... We will put those questions to the Israeli army, but thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, Chris Jonas from the UN's Relief and Works Agency. I like him. Still There's been some activity across Israel's yep. southern border. Uh, Alan Fisher is there. Alan, what's been going on? Well, it, we're just losing the light here now, but what we're going to do is take the camera and zoom in to just over the border, actually inside Gaza itself. Now, what you'll see on our camera is a pile of rubble. That was until just 20 minutes or so ago, a house. What we have been watching over the last few hours are Israeli bulldozers moving into that border area, looking for houses, and when they see them moving in, their bulldozers and their diggers, and systematically pulling them apart, reducing them essentially to rubble, and that's been going on during this three-hour humanitarian window. Now, we've no idea why the Israelis would do that. In the past, they've said that houses like this have been used by Hamas for rocket attacks or house Hamas operatives. So perhaps that's maybe why they're doing it. They've been watching them uh, demolish a number of houses in that area. Like Eamon was saying just a short time ago, we also are hearing the noise of conflict that began just as the uh, deadline was about to run out for the closure of this cessation of violence, this temporary cessation in the fighting. If we look over on the horizon, we can see, actually I'll do it over this shoulder, you can see some of the smoke coming out from the far edges of the Gaza Strip, and we've seen a number of plumes of smoke like that throughout the afternoon, particularly over the last hour or so, and we've also had a number of gun battles raging pretty close to us. So we know that even though the Israeli cabinet have postponed plans for the moment of implementing stage three, stage two is continuing to be implemented and it continues to be bloody and violent. Uh, Alan, what about the uh, rocket fire that landed from uh, Lebanon? Now, the Israeli government are, are, are saying uh, that they don't think it was uh, Hezbollah. Who, who are they blaming for this? <coughs> well, Shimon has said it was a group called the National Front, and they've analysed the rockets that were fired over the border from Lebanon into northern Israel, and they say they are older Katusha rockets, not used 
by Hezbollah anymore, perhaps used by some Palestinian faction, some Palestinian group who are showing support for the people here in Gaza. I can also tell you that the Israelis are reporting three rockets were fired towards the town of Shderot at three o'clock this afternoon. That would be right in the middle of when the violence was meant to be halted. So the Israelis have always said that they wouldn't uh, take any offensive action, but they would respond if they were okay, if attacked. Now, we asked them specifically what would happen if rockets were fired out of the Gaza Strip during that time. And when we asked them that yesterday, they said they simply didn't do it. So three rockets fired towards Shterot during the three-hour window when the violence was meant to hold. I think the Israelis are aware that the Northern Front could always be opened up. They certainly moved thousands of reservists in that direction, put troops on the border, worried that something may happen. And certainly they made it very clear to Hezbollah to the government in Lebanon as well. They wouldn't tolerate any rockets coming over the border. When you tell the time them that three of the Israelis are trying to play that down, saying, look, it's a, an isolated it's incident, 20. I think if it persists day after day, they'll become slightly more concerned. They'll keep an eye on it at the moment, but it's not something that they're overly worried about. Their main concentration remains the battle that's going on right across the Gaza Strip. OK, Alan, thank you for that. Uh, Alan Fisher in the southern Israel there. Now, of course, it's extremely difficult to make contact with people inside Gaza because they're struggling with power cuts and disruption to phone lines. Uh, we have Mohammed Al Sharif on the line. He's a resident of Gaza City. Uh, Mr. Al Sharif, thank you for joining us. Can you tell us uh, where are you? Are, are you still in your house in Gaza City? Yes, I'm still in uh, in my house, uh, in my apartment building, in the western part of the Gaza City. Uh, and do you, are you, do you feel safe there? You don't feel that you want to head to a, a shelter like one of the UN schools? No, uh, we're so far away from the borderline that uh, all the conflict and uh, happening. Um, uh, we're, we're relatively safe in our apartment. Um, uh, but uh, we're not, not far away from the bombing. Yesterday at night, uh, at 2 o'clock, uh, at day, night, I didn't uh, realize uh, that one. The uh, a close by uh, police uh, compound um, uh, made our apartments uh, uh, shaking left and right. Uh, so what we had to do is we just 